Um, it's worse than you could possibly imagine. Um, so I started, I, last week I had 13 TAs. Uh, this week I have one. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. We're going to see how things go. Um, if, uh, incidentally, at any point during this TA strike, you feel that uh, this is not the education that you're paying for, I highly recommend that you voice those concerns to your, uh, ed your local administration, and uh, maybe we can uh, get this strike over with, but uh, somehow I think this one's going to drag on. We'll see how it goes. Um, Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys heard that, like, um, at York, uh, TA struck for an entire school year, right? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Well, you know, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, any questions? I should probably mic myself. Yes? I was just scared to ask, but I noticed that you for um, Midterm remarking. Hmm? You know, there's a process by which you can have grades adjusted after I've left, right? You can submit paperwork with the department uh, in order to uh, in order to have them go back over your grades after I'm no longer under contract. So. Uh, I might have to direct you to that process. Um, we'll see how things go. So. Now I'm, I'm being a patriarch because I, I clipped this thing so that it clips into a man's shirt. There we go. All right. Test, test, test. Well, it seems that uh, I've been defeated anyways. Test. The light's on. Yeah. Test. Downstairs, upstairs? Man, all right. Well, that'd be funny. Anyway, so um, now begins the winter of our discontent. Um, at least we're not in Germany. So <clears throat> let's uh, let's uh, let's continue on with um, this. You know. Bleak though our prospects be, and as pointless as it seems, in the interminable vacuum of space in which our planet is endlessly and pointlessly spinning, let's continue with the lecture material, shall we? So, we were talking, um, oh, for those of you who may not have been here last, uh, yesterday, um, I was being evaluated for a full-time position, um, which I probably won't get, we'll see. Uh, I'm just feeling, like today, today the theme is pessimism. So, um, 
we'll, uh, we jumped ahead and introduced the assembly, uh, the assembly uh, coding portion, the assembly language port portion. Uh, we skipped ahead, skipped through this material. I'm going to now come back to it and do it through, and then we'll continue where we left off with the other material. I realize it's confusing, but uh, if you just watch the lectures in the wrong order on YouTube, everything will be fine. Okay? All right. Not that it matters anyways. So, <clears throat> so we were doing, we were going through this example um, using macro definitions, defined statements, to replace not only integer literals and other associated types of things, but whole pieces of C code. These defined statements can take arguments. These arguments are pieces of C syntax. So it's very important not to think of these guys as proper programming constructs as we have been using them so far. We are performing manipulations of the characters constituting the file in themselves. Right? So for example, something like begin is never a variable, right? It's never any sort of statement at all. As soon as this file is loaded by the compiler, this is a specified find and replace operation. You may be interested to know that many of the things that you use in C are actually defined in this manner. True and false, Boolean literals, are actually defined statements, which are um, defined in standard bool. Null, as in null pointer, is defined in standard lib, and it's just defined as the integer zero. Make sense? So far, so good? You may have noticed that the program on the previous slide contained macros with a function like construction. Yes, you can make your macros take arguments. The process somewhat resembles lambdas in, in uh, Python. Somewhat. Um, this is a lambda in Python. Did, did, they, did they do lambdas with the other one? Okay. Um, very quick digression on lambdas then. So, maybe a slightly longer than quick digression. So, I've talked about Turing completeness, right? The concept of the Turing machine. One of the very important results that was uh, come to by a fellow by the name of Alonzo Church, who was uh, uh, Turing, Alan Turing's PhD supervisor, uh, Alonzo Church and Turing both came up with the idea of Turing equivalence, or the idea that uh, any computational system in which a result may be calculated is, uh, is equivalent to a Turing machine. At some, like it, a equivalent Turing machine can be written. It turns out Alonzo Church himself had his own computational system that he had worked out, which in no way resembles the Turing machine, but integrates much more easily and nicely with regular traditional mathematics. This is known as the lambda calculus. All right? Lambda calculus is a computational system with only two operations, function, abst uh, function abstraction and function application. So the way that it's traditionally wrote, written, if you had something like lambda x, x plus 3 as an expression, lambda x means that we are extracting the symbol x and making it into a function where x will be replaced with whatever we apply. Right? This is 
very, very similar to the idea that you've seen in traditional mathematics. You know, um, f of x is equal to x plus 3. You know, it's basically the same idea, right? Um, so what a lambda is, it's, it's a, it allows you to create a function, like a proper programming function, in line, right? So lambda xy x times y says I am creating a function in place which multiplies the two arguments together. To that, I then apply as arguments 8 and 10. The result, of course, would be 80 when evaluated. You may ask yourself, this seems needless and pointless. Why would you ever want or need to do this? Um, it turns out that uh, in Python, you can do some pretty fancy things, because it borrows some inspiration from functional languages. Um, it is possible, for example, to apply a function to every element of a list using what's called a map function. Right? So you have map some function over some list, and it's basically uh, for, um, for item in list. Um, in, uh, well, I guess I have to do it with a for loop for, uh, you know, for i in range length l, l at i is equal to f of l at i. That's a map function, right? That's actually useful. That you can, you, maybe you can think of ways that could be useful, right? In order to be able to do something like that, you need to be able to take a function as an argument. Now, we have seen examples of this in C, if you cast your brain back uh, to some of the stuff we did in the middle of the course. Remember, we talked about function pointers, right? So we can pass a function, uh, we can pass a pointer to a function to another function in C. This is totally a thing we can do. So, this type of functionality is totally possible in C as well. Nobody calls C a, uh, a multi-paradigm language, though, and Python pretends it's a multi-paradigm language because it can do that. But um, so anyway, that, so that's what a lambda is. Um, any questions about that? Very, very brief digression on lambda calculus again. The reason that this is a computational system is because you can define things like true and false, like Boolean values as functions in lambda calculus, and uh, other lambda calculus functions will correctly calculate other functions from these functions if they're provided as inputs to the functions. It's very like complicated high math type stuff. Um, you probably won't run into it very much in a mechatronics degree. Um, it's the sort of thing the computer scientists study. But uh, it's essential to understand lambda calculus if you want to understand uh, operational semantics, which are the underlying um, mathematical paradigm by which we can prove the utility of programming languages themselves. But uh, in an engineering degree, you're primarily interested in with just using the programming language rather than understanding why. Right? Although it might be interesting to know why, which is why I have these brief digressions. Anyway, so. <clears throat> The main difference, of course, is that we're performing character substitutions, as has been stated many times previously. I should put like a like a yellow piece of tape around it or something so it's more visible against that. Anyway. Yes. The arguments to the pragma may be any group of characters so long as the operation results in valid C code. If it does not result in valid C code, it can be very difficult to debug because the error will appear on a line um, on the line number where the error occurred, but because a substitution has taken place, 
what the compiler sees on that line and what you see looking in the source file are not going to be the same thing. So it can be very difficult to debug errors using defined statements, which is why all of this is generally not done. Right? Make sense? Good. <clears throat> So, if you want to restrict the applicability of a macro, you can use the following to remove them. Undef. So we have define, right? We can define begin. If we place undef begin, that removes that macro from the list of macros that substitutions are being performed on, right? So that macro stops, right? Remember that macros are also imported when you include a library or one of your own source files. Using undef, you can prevent macros you define in one file from being applied to another. Once a macro has been undefined, it can be subsequently redefined, so it can also be useful if you want a macro to perform different substitutions in different parts of your source code file. The above is, does not seem an, advise, an, an advisable use case, as it seems rather spaghetti code-like. But it is possible. Make sense? Good, good. Thumbs up. All right. This is this is kind of like another um, example of me going through a bunch of stuff that you really shouldn't use. <laughs> kind of like when we were talking about go to statements. You should. St it's important for your education, though, that you've seen this stuff. <coughs> Thank you. So. Conditional macros. We can include code, uh, uh, so we can actually physically remove lines of code from a file conditionally by using the if macro. Not to be confused with the if statement. When we in, when we use an if statement in uh, you know regular statements, the both like both branches. All branches of the if statement are still compiled and are still potentially executable, even if your, um, you know, even if the condition is always true or something like that. In theory, you could put a go-to label in it, into it, and you could execute that code anyway, right? Because this is a macro, any lines of code inside of this if this if macro will be actually physically removed prior to compilation. Yeah, unless that if statement comes out true. Make sense? This condition needs to evaluate uh, to zero in order for this to be in order for this code to be deleted. Um, normally commenting things out and like opening and closing comments is, you know, the way people do this type of thing mostly. Um, the conditional expression must have an integral type and can, uh, on, uh, can include only integer constants, character constants, and the defined operator. Remember, this command is being executed before your program compiles. As such, functions, variables, enumerations, and type depths should not be used. Best to stick to macros, integer literals, and standard operators. Use case. In your system files, there are many things which are defined. For example, somewhere inside of your C standard library, C defines how big an integer is. It defines how big a long integer is. If you want some code but not other code conditionally on what the size of an integer is, you can test to see how big the integer is and have code running conditionally. Right? Code included or not included. Different op like the other other types of information available are the type of operating system you're running. If you have, you know, certain compatibility things that you're running, in the case where you're, uh, you know, running it on a Mac versus Windows versus Linux, that code can be actually blocked in or blocked out using if macros. Make sense? Okay. 
Common use, uh, common use cases of if statements. Uh, preventing a header file from being included multiple times in the same project. Giving a program a debug mode. That's actually a pretty common one. So, sometimes you have your production version of your code and you have your, your working version of your code and they have slightly different aspects, right? We all know how debugging C goes by this point. It requires a lot of print statements. It's a pain in the ass to have to go through your file and comment, all of, comment out all of your print statements, right? I'm sure we've all been there at this point. It's more work to set it up, but if you include your print statements inside of these if definitions and set a debug macro at the beginning, say debug equals one or debug equals zero, if debug print, right? That way, you can set debug mode as one or zero at the top of the file, or any you know at some point in the file. You can sometimes even pass these in as uh, as command line arguments, and then the print statements will either exist or not exist conditionally on whether you've enabled debug mode or not. Make sense? So that's a that's a cool little use case. <clears throat> That's actually like reasonably common debug modes. Um, if you uh, if you look at some of the uh, you know if you look at many of the sort of common Unix programs, many of them will have what's termed a verbose mode, which has a very similar uh, similar thing it does. Basically, it just prints all the information, or it prints not all the information, right? Because not all of the information is interesting or relevant unless you're doing something very specific and then you want to see it all and then you put it in verbose mode, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Making sense so far, hopefully? <clears throat> Setting different constants or executing different statements depending on the system defined values. This could be the word size of the processor, the version number of the operating system, or many other things. This assumes the program will be compiled from source on multiple different systems. So uh, if you want, you can just you know, set your code to never execute on Windows 7, you know, if you want. Um, was it 7 that was the one everybody hated, or was it Vista? It was a Vista, it wasn't it? It was 8, everybody hated 8? OK. Yeah. I mean, insofar as everybody should always hate Windows anyways, you know? It's like, what's the local minimum in terms of Windows quality, you know? Use Linux, anyway. So, <clears throat> as you might expect, you don't just have the straight if and if constructs, you can also have, you know, else cases and elif cases. Um, you don't have else space if because the space is meaningful inside of a uh, inside of a macro definition right you can also have if def which is shorthand for if this thing is defined and if n def is short for if this thing is not defined which is just to check to see if other macros have been declared whatever x is um, you can use if to comment out blocks of code as well Using uh, open and close comment doesn't allow for nesting, but if and end if do allow for nesting, so if that's interesting to you. Um, oh, by the way, have you guys uh, figured out yet the, um, the trick to only have to be able to toggle code by only using one of these guys? Have you guys figured that one out yet? Yeah? Just put the second one at the end if you want to toggle and you put the first one in. Yes. So, um, in C, if you want to be able to quickly toggle the existence of some block of code, so you comment out the, the closing comment. That way, you know, you can delete this. This is still valid code. You can put it back in, and it, it, it still works. It's, uh, yeah. anyway. <clears throat> Maybe you'll find that useful. So, yes. Are you calling out both instead of deleting one of the components? What's the difference? I don't know. It's like the point is that you can just copy the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I can only 
I think I think you can I think you can comment on top one too. I don't know if it'll still count as a comment. And I have to test it, but again, the question the question you raise is a valid one. Why? Yeah. Why would you want to have to delete five characters instead of two? Well, it might. If you did this, like it depends on how this behaves. If this means that this is no longer a start comment, then this is the on state, and that's the off state. But like, again, it's six to one, half a dozen to the other. You know. But uh, then again, I, okay. So here's one thing: it does keep the position of the start of the comment stable, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. All right. You've convinced me. <coughs> so, miscellaneous additional directives. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm going to give you my doctorate right now. Here we go. Um, so. I actually got a piece of paper on Friday. It's, um, it's kind of cool. When you're a PhD, you get a much fancier robe. Um, uh, has anybody been to a convocation ceremony? Um, yeah, so the PhD robe is like, like maroon and gray, which I assume are the school colors. And like you get like a, a fancier hood as well. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so, for those of you who entered a bachelor's degree not knowing this, the actual official um, indication that you are a bachelor of X is that you get a hood, which doesn't really function as a hood. It's primarily symbolic. It's not very. Comf it's not designed for wear or use. But um, in theory, you can't actually pop it on your head. But um, um, but yeah, it's like it's just like a long piece of fabric that's looped, and they put it around your shoulders, and that is the conferring of your bachelor's degree, right? Um, yeah. Did you just keep it? You can buy them from the bookstore <laughs> if you'd like a souvenir memorabilia. Um, no, I was really miffed when I found out they don't let you keep them. It's like, come on. All this work, you should have stayed on How many thousands of dollars I've given you, and you can't afford to give me? I have to, I have to use someone else's hood, you know? I should have my own hood. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I should have my name in it somewhere. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, um, it's, yeah, that's like. That's like old, old, old ancient medieval tradition, actually. Um, the, uh, the mortar board with the tassel, that's what I'm supposed to be wearing while I'm lecturing, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> but maybe someday I'll, uh, I'll come in with the mortar board. <laughs> that's, what that, that's what the flat cap, flat cap of the square, that's what that's called. But um, <clears throat> because it, uh, you know, it resembles the masonry tool used to hold the mortar while you're mortising joints and, put, and building a brick wall it resembles the medieval tool they would use to, uh, to mortar walls with, which is why they call it a mortar board. Um, also, it might be a joke about how um, academics have their heads filled with cement. So, <coughs> anyway. <clears throat> so anyway, error. Prints an error message. What the error message says depends on your system and the C implementation. Halts compilation and, ex and upon execution. So if, I don't know, I don't know why you'd ever use this unless you were building a compiler, but there it is. Pragma performs miscellaneous commands. Which pragmas are available depends on your system and C implementation. Using pragmas may make your code less portable, or lay portable. Um, Line integer manually changes the line number of the source file 
why you would ever need to do that is beyond, beyond the scope of mere mortals, but there you have it. Uh, generally used to generate more meaningful compiler warnings and errors, I suppose, but I don't know. Again, this is like stuff, why would you ever use it? But you should know that it exists because if you're ever poking around inside of the C standard library, you'll probably see this kind of thing, stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, moving swiftly on. Command line arguments. It's kind of amazing that we haven't gotten to this yet, right? So, when you write a C program, you can write it in such a manner that it takes arguments from a command line input. Um, if you are wondering how GCC manages to do it, it does it in this manner. You can include two arguments to main, argc and argv. They don't actually have to be called this, but they're called this by convention. Argc is the number of arguments that you have received. Argv is the strings of the arguments that you've received. Right? So, where arg with C is the, yeah, 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 yeah. The types of arguments commonly provided to programs are names of files or folders to be operated on and modes of operation for the program. Um, let me see if I've got an example. I think the next slide, yeah, this has an example. Let me just see what I got here. So, this is a simple program. All it does is it prints out the arguments which are received over the command line. Right? Um, so, so, if I call it, and all I've called is a.out, number of arguments provided is one. Those arguments are a.out. So you can see the invocation of the program itself counts as the first argument, or argument zero if you are indexing them. Um, this is a bunch of arguments. There you go. I would like Right? So, um, yeah. Make sense? Question? So, is this only the name that you can get? Yes. Um, this is what the input to main looks like. You either do this, or you reject doing this by doing uh, by putting void in there. Make sense? Question. Um, so it's always strings. Yes, always strings. If it, if you want to receive a number, then you have to, uh, you know, use one of those lovely string to number conversion functions that we covered in the middle of the class. Make sense? Any other questions? Yes. So, this is a command line invocation of the program, right? When I invoke the command, I am providing additional arguments by typing a bunch of things and putting spaces between them, right? By including argv and argc in the main declaration, I am, like the operating system, takes these and feeds them into those two, two input arguments to main. They may then be used by the program more generally. Right? So, you know, for example, when I do when I when I enter gcc command line.c, right? GCC is also a program. Its main function has definitions for argc and argv. In this case, argc would return 2. Arg, argument argv0 would be GCC, 
arg v, one would be command line dot c. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. This isn't very related, but why is ETOI not considered safe? <clears throat> um, oh. Now I have to remember that. Um, it takes too long to know that. Uh, you're just trying to gum up the rest of the class, aren't you? Um, it's old. Um, it's an old previous version. I, oh, it like doesn't work on all cases. Um, I forget if it's like, it doesn't handle negatives well. Oh, no, it doesn't handle integers over a certain size. And like the size is like a short int or something. Like it's it's something like that. It's 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 old, it's obsolete, it's outdated, don't use it. Despite the fact that if you go on the internet and everybody everybody will say use it. Alright? Um STR two L, my friend. STR two L. If you look it up on uh, if you look it up on um, Stack Overflow, there's a good article someone's written about why uh, why AT A2I has been superseded by STR2L. <clears throat> this knowing stuff like this is the difference between being a bedroom programmer and having an education. So. Good. All right. This is our final topic of C programming, so prepare your butts. We're going to talk about signals, and we're going to talk about them in 10 minutes. C does not support exception handling. Exception handling is something that was introduced later by later programming languages. However, like many things in C, we do not handle exception handling, but we handle something kind of similar to exception handling that's not quite the thing you expect it to be, but it's still kind of related. Right? We handle signals. Signals, um, at, so signals are operating system constructs, not internal to the program. A C program receives signals from the operating system. Uh, you guys remember when I did like an infinite loop and then I hit control C to kill the, uh, kill the program? What I was actually doing is I was sending the kill signal from my, or the, uh, you know, maybe it's, I think it's sig interrupt, not sig kill. It might, no, yeah, because kill is the signal that's sent by HTOP or like, um, you know, the, the task manager, right? When you have a program that's not responding in Windows and you go into Task Manager and you try to kill it, you're sending the kill signal, right, in this manner. So, for each process, the operating system maintains two integers which indicate the status of various signals. One is for pending signals, the other blocks pending signals. The signal handling library of C is signal.h. This library contains a number of defined values which indicate various signal types. Most of these signals correspond closely to the types of exceptions you would see in Python. Um, but, <clears throat> so it goes. So, this is also knowledge that can be used for purposes of extreme evil, as once you have, once you have learned the stuff in this section, you will be able to write an unkillable program. Incidentally, one other type of signal that you may have received quite a bit in this class is the segmentation fault. Yes? So if, if you don't include signal.h, how does it know how to handle the, the kill signal that the OS gives it through like task manager? Does it if not? the signal goes unhandled, it just kills the program. Okay. Yeah. But if the signal is handled, you can tell it to, to do other code if it receives the signal rather than just kill just rather than just killing itself, right? 
So, <clears throat> types of signals. Sig abort, abnormal termination of the program, such as calls to the function abort. Sig FPE, uh, erroneous arithmetic operations, such as divide by zero. Uh, so, divide by zero is a signal sent by the operating system. Sig ill, detection of an illegal instruction. So, somehow, your compilation has been like your executable has been corrupted or something. A bit has flipped in one of in, in your program memory, and uh, somehow you've managed to try to execute an instruction that doesn't exist on the CPU, or something like that. Sig ill, sig int, receipt of an interactive attention signal. So sig int is me trying to kill the program from the command line. Sig seg v an attempt to access memory not allocated to the program. That is the true name of evil, the true name of the dreaded, dreaded and deadly seg fault. And sig term, termination request sent to the program. Uh, sig kill might be another name for sig term in some systems. I'm not sure. I think that's the same thing. So this is what you do. In order to handle a signal, you must register a function to activate for an incoming signal of a particular type using the signal function. So, signal, you specify a signal type as given previously. Then you give a function pointer to the function you want to handle that signal. This is basically the same thing as a try except, except it's globally applicable. And rather than actually putting the code inside of the except, you put it in a function and give the uh, give the thing a pointer to that function. Question. So, will the signal activate wherever, whenever you activate it? Like. Yeah. As soon as the signal is received, execution is halted. The function handling the signal is entered. It does its thing. Then execution resumes at the point that it stopped. So, <clears throat> um, the function associates an incoming signal type with the function. If the signal is received during program execution, execution is paused, and the function is immediately entered. Exactly the same as if a regular, ordinary function were called. Right? Once the function is terminated, the association between the signal and the function is broken. Fortunately, it is possible, or unfortunately, it is possible to call signal from within the signal handling function. And therein lies the trick to making an unkillable program. If your signal, like if you handle sig, uh, sig term with a function that just reestablishes the link between itself and sig term, all uh, termination requests received by the program uh, will essentially be ignored. You can even have the thing like print ha 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 in the terminal if you want to. You had a question? Yeah. So could you potentially use this for like if you're stuck in an infinite loop, you can do the signal and let this auto like change the values of what it would take like to get out of the loop? Well, you also have to be aware of contexts, right? So like the function here doesn't have access necessarily to mains or your, your other functions variables unless they're global. Right? So if it was a global variable, you'd be able to do step that kind of thing. But if it's all local variables that you're dealing with, which you should be because that's good practice, um, this isn't going to help you in that respect. Yes? Where would you um, put this? Like Right at the top of main, right. generally. Okay. It's like one of the first things you want to do is establish the links between your signals. and uh, Yeah. Cool. So. Uh, a long and somewhat humorous example. I'll, uh, I'll just pull up the code in the file. Bananas.c. So we have a handle sig int function, right? Takes int signal value. Uh, it has to do that. That's a thing that's required. Um, finish is equal to 1. Finish is a global variable, set to 0 initially. And uh, we set this signal up at the beginning. And you can see this thing's inside of an infinite loop. So let's run that function, or run this program.
Oh, also, if you haven't um, if you haven't run across this yet, sleep one is like pause one second. So that's how I'm getting it to like, you know, scroll slowly. Yes. Is that in the standard library? Yeah. Sleep, um, might be in this one, uni standard. H. I think it's in that one actually. So, yeah. so uh, I just give it, yeah, it'll just keep going forever. It's in an infinite loop. I just sent sig int. Knock, knock, who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange, you glad I didn't say banana. And then it finishes. Now, thank you, thank you. Um, just a couple of things before we finish. Um, sending it twice doesn't fix it. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. Um, all right. Anyway, one more slide. Ta-da! You finished C. That's everything about C that you need to know. Except for unions, which we didn't talk, talk about because they're dumb. You can look it up. But, uh, yes. Now you know everything about C. Yes, but actually no. Um, there's still quite a bit to learn about the standard library that we didn't have to talk about. But uh, in general, you are now perfect C programmers. So use your skills.